And this morning, as I share with you some things this morning, I think it's going to be a blessing with you. This is part three in a series that we began in the beginning of the year uh, called, called, called A Call to Fan the Flame. And this is part three in this series. And I'd like you to open your Bibles to our main text, which has been 2 Timothy chapter 1. We're going to read that again. We're going to review a few things quickly. And then we're going to get into some things here this morning uh, that the Lord's laid on my heart today. Praise God. 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1. And we're going to read here verses 6 and 7. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, uh, remembering again that Timothy was in a, a difficult place. He was being uh, persecuted. The church was being persecuted big time at this particular time. Uh, I mean, Nero, the emperor of Rome at that time, was a madman and was killing Christians. Uh, we won't go through that whole thing again. But in 2 Timothy uh, chapter 1 and verses 6 and 7. Now remember, Paul is writing to Timothy, who was the pastor at the church at Ephesus at this time. And so this is the pastor, Tim. And he says, says in verse 6, Therefore I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying out of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And so we talked about this idea, this word, stir up. Everybody say stir up. Stir up. How many of you believe the church needs a little stirring up today? Amen. 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 How many of you believe maybe you need a little stirring up today? Amen. Hallelujah. Well, we're going to talk about this. You'll notice uh, the definition of stir up. Again, some of this is a, a repeat or review in order to set the stage for what we want to go further with. But notice you could translate the command to stir up as repeat enthusiastically what you've done in the past to put life back into your spiritual fire. Everybody say fire. fire. To put life back into your spiritual fire. Be fervent, wholehearted, zealous, passionate, and vigorous about it. And so again, we're talking about stirring up a fire in our hearts because apathy, lukewarmness, all these things uh, try to come against us, do come against us. I'm sure that all of us at one time or another in our Christian life, we have struggled with staying on fire for God. We've struggled with being zealous for the things of God. And so therefore, we need to know how and be reminded sometimes to stir up that fire. You'll notice the next, uh, uh, the other translation that we want to give you from the ESV translation, it says this, for this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying out of my hands. For God gave us not or gave, a, gave us a spirit not of fear, but a power of love and of self-control. So again, fanning the flame. Fanning the flame. That's what we're attempting to do by faith and learn how to do it. The Amplified of verse 6 reads it this way. That is why I would remind you to stir up, rekindle the embers of, fan the flame of, and keep burning the gracious gift of God, the inner fire that is in you by means of the laying out of my hands with those of the elders at your ordination. And so the inner fire to fan the flame of the inner fire. And there's so many things that come against us that can kind of not necessarily quench that fire, but to cause that fire to be uh, subdued, to cause it to be a little bit less than what it is, or maybe even a lot less than what it is, uh, to become like glowing embers perhaps, or, or just, you know, coals of a fire just glowing basically, or maybe even can't even be seen until you, until you start what? Until you start stirring it up. If you've ever had a campfire or a fire in your fireplace, you know sometimes so after it's been burning for a while, the fuel's on the fire, and you've got you've to put more fuel on it after it's burned up, stir it a little bit, maybe blow, uh, fan it a little bit, fan the flame, right? And it begins to burst forth again, and that flame goes uh, further. And many times that inner fire uh, that God has given you and me after receiving Christ as Lord and filling us with His Spirit, it needs a little fanning, it needs a little stirring in order to get on fire again. Amen? I mean, the cares of this world, perhaps desires of other things, perhaps a disappointments, discouragements, all sorts of things happen in our lives that can potentially quench that fire or lessen that fire in our hearts. Uh, but you know what? Those are all indirectly or directly ploys of our adversary, the devil, to get us lukewarm, uh, to get us non-caring, indifferent, apathetic about the things of God. But God desires that we be on fire all the time, 24-7. Amen? 
Amen. And we know that there are times for all of us uh, that that may, may lack, but yet we have the tools we need in order to get it going again. Romans 12, verse 11, the Amplified Bible up on the screen reads this way, Never lag in zeal and in earnest endeavor. Be aglow and burning with the Spirit serving the Lord. And so, so far, we've talked about how do we fan the flame. I've given you two ways to fan, fan the flame. First of all, we must humble ourselves before God. And we mentioned to you Isaiah chapter 57, verse 15, where uh, the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah uh, said that God revives, or, or God spoke through Isaiah and said that God revives the hearts of the humble, the contrite ones, right? And so humility basically means, God, I need you. God, I need your help. Humility recognizes their need. And when we're of a humble mind, we're saying, God, I know I have a need. I know I'm not where I'm supposed to be. I know I need to tap into you better. And when we are humble before God, we know the scripture says repeatedly that he resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Amen. Amen. And so we humble ourselves, first of all, in order to fan that flame, in order to get that flame going again. Secondly, we dealt with this last week. And we did it uh, because it's a fact, but also to prepare us for four nights of prayer, which was fantastic. I appreciate everybody that came out. I thought the Spirit of God moved mightily, and I believe He's going to continue to move mightily. It's great to start the year off praying, but praying never stops. Amen. And so prayer. And from there we saw this uh, concerning Peter who had been taken into prison by uh, Herod uh, after he had killed John. He saw the Jews like that. So uh, he uh, decided I'm going to put Peter in prison. And it says in verse 5 of the Amplified Bible of Acts 12, it says, so Peter was kept in prison, but fervent prayer. That's fiery prayer. Everybody say fiery prayer. Fire. Fervent prayer for him was persistently made to God by the church assembly. And so fiery prayer, consistent prayer, pressing in kind of prayer, determined prayer, is what caused God to move. And the angel of the Lord set him free, went in there and broke him out of prison. Isn't that right? Amen. And so God answered prayer. The word fervent, as you can see there, uh, means to be fiery hot, to boil, to glow, to be full of burning zeal. It's the opposite of dignified, cold, and unemotional. And so you know what? When it comes to the things of God, there's a, there's a time to be emotional. Not out of control emotions, but there's a time to have some fire and some passion for the things of God. Amen. Now, some may say, well, Pastor, you know, you're kind of more inclined that way. But if you know me, you know that's not true. I'm a very introverted person. I'm a very shy person in the natural. But thank God for the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. Amen. Because he helps us be what we can't be in the natural, and therefore he alone gets the glory for it. We gave you this quote last time, and we're still reviewing some. Rick Renner said this. He's an author, Bible teacher, great teacher. He says, if you want to keep burning for the Lord, you have to add fuel to your spiritual flame. And one of the fuels you need is prayer. When you really enter into prayer, it puts fuel on the spiritual flame in your life, and it causes you to come ablaze with the power of God. I mean, I love that, don't you? I can tell about four of you do, but the rest of you, you're going to get it eventually, all right? Now, E.M. Bounds, a, a man from years gone by, a great man of God, wrote many books on the subject of prayer. He said this, he said, prayers must be red hot. It is the fervent prayer that, uh, that is effectual and that availeth. Coldness of spirit hinders praying. Prayer cannot live in a wintry atmosphere. Chilly surroundings freeze out petitioning and dry up the springs of supplication. It takes fire to make prayers go. Warmth of soul creates an atmosphere fear favorable to prayer because it is favorable to fervency by flame prayer ascends to heaven yet fire is not fuss nor heat noise heat is intensity something that glows and burns heaven is a mighty poor market for ice Ian Bounds could be a little bit poetic, couldn't he, right? But nevertheless, you get the point that prayer is an important part to get that fire stirred up again uh, in your heart for the things of God. Prayer is not meant to be boring. Prayer is not meant to be a burden. Prayer is meant uh, to be something that spurs us on. The more you do it, the more you want to do it. Isn't that right? Yes. And uh, as I probably shared with you last week, if you're finding it hard to pray, uh, just begin uh, by saying and praying this, God, help me want to pray. Say, God, I want want to want to pray, but I'm struggling with my prayer life. I'm finding my prayer life boring. How many of you know God already knows what you're thinking anyway? You might as well verbalize it and it helps you to verbalize it, doesn't it sometimes? And so you know what? You say to God, God, I need your help to want to pray. And then you begin to pray. You begin to intercede. You begin to speak the word of God. You begin to read the word. And uh, there's many things we can say about prayer. We may do a series on prayer soon. Uh, we, we are, uh, there's so many things I could talk about in series. I, I want to do a series on the fear of God. How many of you know that's biblical? Amen. I want to do another series on our covenant with God. And so uh, praise God. There's just too much to talk about. I, I get amazed that these pastors have been pastoring a church for four years. Say, I told 
told them everything I know, and now I'm moving on to another church. Well, I'll tell you, you know, first of all, we need reminders, and not only that, but when the Holy Spirit puts something fresh on, it doesn't matter if we've known it once, we need it fresh again. Isn't that right? Amen? And God will bring new enlightenment, new understanding to these things as we trust Him uh, to do that. And, and He better do that because I've been pastoring this church for going on 28 years. Can you believe that? That's just amazing. Anyway, praise God. 28 years. Where did that time go? And so, we must humble ourselves, number one, to fan the flame in our hearts. We must be people of prayer. And then today, I want to focus for a few moments on, we must feed upon God's Word regularly. Now, some of you that come to this church, you might get fed up, uh, so to speak, or get tired of me talking about the importance of the Word of God, but I will never cease to tell you how important it is uh, to be in the Word of God. Jeremiah chapter 20 and verse 9, it reads this way. Jeremiah was in a quandary. He was being persecuted. Uh, you know, he's called the weeping prophet. He had a lot of people against him, but it says this, Then I said, it's up on the screen, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more in his name, but his word was in my heart like a burning fire, shut up in my bones. I was weary of holding it back, and I could not. How many of you know his word can be like fire? Amen? His word can be like fire. Turn with me in your Bibles, if you would, to Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. We're talking about fanning the flame in our heart, first of all, by humility, recognizing your need, asking God to help you, and then prayer, having a prayer life. And this one, being regularly in the word of God and letting the word of God get into you, we might add. In Luke's gospel, chapter 24, if you're there, say yes. We're going to start reading here at verse 13, Luke 24, verse 13. This is the account of the two disciples after Jesus' resurrection, the two disciples on the road to Emmaus just walking along, and they're talking. And in verse 13 it says this, Now behold, two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. So it was while they conversed and reasoned that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. Verse 17 is where I'm at. And he said to them, what kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? So these two disciples, after his resurrection, they're walking along the road to Emmaus and, and heading for Emmaus, you know, seven miles or whatever. And, and here comes Jesus and they don't recognize him, the resurrected Jesus. And he begins to talk to them. And it says in verse 18, then the one whose name was Cle uh, Cleopas answered and said to him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? And have you not known the things which happened there in these days? And he said to them, what, ha what things? So they said to him the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word, before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. So the third day he rose again, didn't he? Amen? Verse 22, yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us when they did not find his body. They came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said, he was alive. Verse 24, and certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. Verse 25, then he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets had spoken, ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory. Verse 27, and beginning at Moses, that's the five books, the first books of the Bible, five, first five books, beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Then, verse 28, they drew near to the village where they were going and he indicated that he would have gone farther but they constrained him saying abide with us for it is toward evening and the day is far spent and he went to stay with them now it came to pass as he sat at the table with them that he took bread blessed and broke it and gave it to them then their eyes were open and they knew him and he vanished from their sight notice verse 32 and they said to one another did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scripture to us? Did our hearts not burn within us while he talked with us and opened the scriptures to us? Again, the fire of God, the fire in the word of God. So many times we have this notion the word of God is boring. It's only boring if we attempt to approach it uh, by ourselves and without the help of the author of the book, and that's the Holy Spirit. Amen? 
And you know, one of the things that I often pray uh, when I go to the Word of God, almost always, I pray, God, give to me. It's the prayer uh, that Paul prayed for the Ephesians in Ephesians chapter 1. He prayed this prayer, that you, Lord, would give to me the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of you, that you would open up the eyes of my understanding to the Word of God, that I may know what is the hope of your calling, that, that I might know what is the riches of the glory of your inheritance in the saints, and that I might know what is the exceeding greatness of your power toward those who believe. I pray that God would open my eyes. How many of you believe that God will do it if you ask in faith? Amen? And so again, verse 32, it says, Did our hearts not burn within us when he opened up the scriptures to us? I don't know if you've experienced that. I've experienced that. In fact, to a certain extent, I'm experiencing right now just a burning in my heart with the Word of God. The Word of God will just bring a burning, a fire into our hearts, a passion uh, into our hearts. Notice what, again, Rick Renner said this. It's up on the screen. Are you getting anything out of this today? See, I don't only want to impart to you Scripture or the Word of God. I want to impart to you, with the, by the help of the Spirit of God, a, a renewed love for the Word of God. A renewed love for the Word of God because I believe the Word of God is, is everything you and I need in life as it's anointed by the Spirit of God. Amen? Rick Renner said this, their hearts burned when the Scriptures entered into them. He's speaking of the account we just read. The Scripture and spiritual fire are connected. And this word burn in verse 32 is the Greek word that means to be ignited, to be set on fire, or even to be consumed with fire. So you could actually translate the verse like this. Did not our hearts feel ignited within us as he spoke about the Scriptures with us? Or did not our hearts feel set on fire within us as he spoke God's Word to us? Or didn't our hearts burn within us and feel consumed in a blaze of fire as he spoke. And so again, igniting. Uh, some of us, we need a little bit of an ignition going on here. Amen? Rick Renner went on to say this, when you ingest the Bible, it literally unleashes the power of God and ignites a flame inside your heart. Just like when you put a match to kindling, when you put the Word of God in your heart, you'll begin to burn with spiritual fire. And I'll tell you, there is some amazing truth to the idea of spending time in the Word of God every single day. I shared with you a few weeks ago about some of the statistics about the power of the Word of God. How when you spend more than four times, four times or more each week in the Word of God, how it revolutionizes your life. The statistics have proven that out. I mean, I mean, you know, sin drops down by a great percentage. Depression goes down. Everything. I mean, anything that you're struggling with, I challenge you. If you'll spend spend more than four times a week in the scripture, which means going to church on Sunday morning is not enough. If you'll spend four or more times in the scripture every week, especially the New Testament, because that's written to you, the church, if you will, I believe God will just spark a fire in your heart, perhaps like you've never experienced before in your life. But you know what? A lot of Christians, they don't want that fire. They don't want to do that. Why don't they want to do that? Because they feel like God's going to require something of them if they do that. They feel like if I just stay lukewarm, God won't require anything of me, or at least I won't know God's requiring anything of me. And so if I don't know uh, God's not going to require, if I don't know God's requiring anything of me, then I'll, I'll, be, I'll be feeling better about it. But I challenge you, God wants you on fire. And, and being in the Word of God will help kindle that flame. It's the greatest fuel you have uh, to kindle that flame in your heart. Are you hearing me? Because someday you and I are all going to stand before him. And I want him to say to you and to me, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of the Lord. But it won't be well done if we're not on fire. It won't be well done if we're lukewarm and apathetic about the things of God. Notice as we go on onto the screen, this is a guy by the name of Norm Robertson in his book, Walking in Victory, he said this, the Bible is the book that contains the mind of God, the state of man, the way of salvation, the doom of sinners, and the happiness of believers. Its doctrines are holy, its precepts binding, its history is true, and its decisions immutable or unchangeable. We should read it to be wise, believe it to be safe, and practice it to be holy. Then going on, the Bible contains light to direct us, food to support us, and comfort to cheer us. It's the traveler's map, the pilgrim's staff, the pilot's compass, the soldier's sword, and the Christian's character. Here heaven is opened and the gates of hell disclosed. Christ is its grand subject, our good, its design, and the glory of God, its end. The Bible should fill our memory, rule our hearts, and guide our feet in righteousness and true holiness. I mean, that, those are powerful, powerful statements. Would you not agree? Amen? But you see, if you believe it, you'll do something about it. If you don't believe it, you won't do a thing about it. Isn't that right? 
Amen. So we're not here to give you just sort of a, a sugar-coated motivational message that does you no good. We want to challenge you today. Challenge you to be in the scriptures today. Challenge you to ask God to help you. The Bible is, we could say, and many more things, it is a mirror to reflect. It's like a mirror where you find out what you look like in Christ. It's a mirror to reflect. It's a seed to multiply, the seed of God's Word. How many of you know a seed contains potential to become so much more? Isn't that right? And so the Word of God is the seed to multiply. It's a lamp to guide. Your Word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path, the psalmist said. It's Psalm 119. It's a lamp to guide, to walk in the light. It's food to nourish. We need spiritual food. And you you need that spiritual food uh, to keep you on fire. It's honey for dessert. The Bible talks about uh, that, that, that the word of the Lord is like honey and it's sweetness to our soul. Amen? Amen? It's a sword to cut and it's called the sword of the spirit in Ephesians 6, 17. And we need that sword in order to combat against the temptations of our adversary who brings, who brings temptations against us. It's a sword to cut and much, much more. Now, real quickly here, is everybody doing all right? All right, the value of God's word. Now, obviously, I cannot do this justice in this one session. But I want to give these to you, and I know it's too much for you to write down. I understand that. We will do our utmost to get this on the website in PDF form so that you can uh, look at it, maybe write it down, print it off, whatever it is that you can do. We will do our best to get it on there because I want you to have these things. I don't want to just, uh, you know, spout them off and, and you forget about them. I want you to have them. And so we'll do our best to get them online, get them on the website and a PDF so that you can get those as well. But the value of God's Word. If we don't read the Bible, we'll walk in darkness. How many of you know in the day we live in, we need to walk in the light? Amen? Along this line, if we don't read the Bible, we won't be clear on doctrine and we'll be open to deception. Let me tell you something. There is more deception out there than what you even recognize, I would dare say. And it's not just people that are obviously in cults or false religions. I'll tell you, there's a lot of deception out there being preached by preachers out there. I, in fact, I was uh, thumbing through. I was looking for the weather this morning. You know one thing about the weather. I don't know why they do this. I do know why they do this. They give you just a tinge. They give you just a little bit. They say, I'll give you the full the full, uh, the full full forecast in just a few moments. All they gave you was today. I can look out the window and see what's today right now. They give you today and they say in a few moments, I'll give you the full forecast. I hate that. I don't know about you. So anyway, I'm flipping through there and, and, and I happen to go on this one, uh, this one Christian TV station and uh, here's this preacher. Now I, I, you say, well, you're being critical. Well, let me tell you, we have to be discerning. Let's not be gullible. Too many Christians are gullible. And he's talking about, you know, he, he's got this, you, some of you might know who I'm talking about. I hope you don't listen to this guy. But anyway, he's got this millionaire's Bible now. And he's got, I can't remember how many, 100 ways to become a millionaire. And of course, in order to do that, you've got to give his ministry $300. The reality of it is, he's the one becoming a millionaire. You understand that, right? All right, but it's deception. Everybody say deception. And so don't swallow that. I don't care if they really are Christians, and I don't doubt his salvation, but I do doubt his doctrine. Are you hearing me here today? All right, and so we need to be discerning about these things and have, you know, a sense of, of you know, God gave us a brain. Too many Christians don't use it. God gave it to us to use it. Amen? And so let's use our brain, and when things are obvious, like that's obvious, then we need to be discerning. Amen? All right, so if we don't read the Bible, we won't be clear on doctrine. We'll be open to deception. And deception will cause the flame to go out, or it'll at least cause it to wane, if you will. And so there's too much of that going on today. And, and wh where was I here? Uh, yeah, okay. Let, let's, uh, okay, I, I had some ideas about false apostles. Let's go to the next frame here. Noah, if you don't mind, he's, he's got control of it this time because this thing wasn't working. And so I'm looking at this. False apostles, false prophets, false shepherds. How many of you know the Bible warns about all of those? Isn't that right? False teachers, false brethren, false Christs or anointed ones. I mean, we need to be watchful of these things. And the only way we can be discerning is by way of the Scriptures. And, and, you know, there's just so many things that I don't have time to teach on all of this right now, obviously. Uh, but we need to be uh, very careful uh, about looking at things and understanding things, even if there are apparent signs and wonders, even if there are apparent uh, healings and miracles. How many of you know Jesus warned about lying wonders? Isn't that right? Lying signs and wonders. 
And one way you discern that is who is getting glorified? Is it that individual or is it Jesus Christ? Are you hearing me here today? And so we need to be watchful of these things. And, you know, this is a passion of mine. So I have to be careful not to go too much in a rabbit trail on this right now because i got too much to talk about it and you're running, I'm running out of time. And so i got to talk fast. But anyway, going back to this then, the value of God's Word. If we don't read the Bible, we'll walk in darkness. If we don't read the Bible, we won't be clear on doctrine and we'll be open to deception. Thirdly, if we don't read the Bible, our faith won't be strong. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Most of you know that, but you need to know it again. If you really believed it, you'd be in your Bible more probably. Are you hearing me here? If we don't read the Bible, we won't grow spiritually and we need to be growing. You should have a plan that you're not going to be in the same place you are next year that you are this year in your spiritual growth. Amen? And how do you measure spiritual growth? You don't measure spiritual growth by gifts of the Spirit. Spiritual growth is, is primarily determined by the fruit of the Spirit. And that is summed up by the love of God. Amen? The walk of love is really the measure of growth. And not that we're looking at others and measuring their growth. Let's look at ourselves. Amen? And see if we're growing in the love of God, which is spiritual growth, really. Becoming more Christ-like on the outside. Amen? If we don't read the Bible, we'll, we will be weak. We will not be strong. And lastly, if we don't read the Bible, we will backslide. And so I cannot overemphasize the importance of the Bible. There's more we could talk about with this. Uh, down the road, another series I want to do, and again, Lord, help me. There's just too much, so many things to say and not enough time. But, you know, I need to teach people how to study the Bible. We've done that before, but it's been a long time. How do we study the Bible? I encourage you to spend most of your time in the New Testament. Obviously, we thank God for the Old Testament. We believe we should read the Old Testament. Some of the best illustrations for New Testament truth is found in the Old. Amen? Amen? Uh, but for our, for our growth and all of these things, we need it all, but to spend more time in the new than we do the old, all right? Some people, they're going to read through the Bible. They spend all the time in Genesis. They do good in Genesis. It's January. People started Genesis. So they start in Genesis. Genesis is not bad. We taught through the whole book of Genesis here, right? Took us, I don't know how many years. <laughs> no, I, I don't remember. But we talked through the whole book of Genesis, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. We love Genesis. It's great. Then after Genesis, you, you go to Exodus. Exodus is not too bad. I mean, it's, I, I love Exodus, don't you? I mean, we talk about, you know, the deliverance of Israel out of Egypt, and we see the Passover, and we see Jesus typified in that, and, and all of that. Are you hearing what I'm saying? That we love Exodus. And, and so people, you know, in the beginning of the year, they'll read Genesis, and they'll get to Exodus, and then they get to Leviticus, and now they're in trouble. Because Leviticus can really bog you down, isn't that right? Amen. And so, you know, that's why we encourage you, you know, uh, yes, we want to read the whole Bible. We believe the whole Bible is needed, but the New Testament is written to you. The Old Testament is written for you. And there is a difference. Old Testament's written for us. The New Testament's written to us. And so praise God for that. Now I'm going to end this with this. My dream for church, being this is the beginning of the year, and some of you have heard this, but it's been a while. This is kind of my dream. The Lord gave this to me a while back, and I'm going to end with this, and, and we'll get out at a decent time. You're still going to beat the Baptist to the diner, I trust. But anyway, but I want to give this to you, and I want you to pray on this. I want, you to get, I want this to get into your heart, and I believe that this will help kindle that fire afresh in your heart as well. Uh, notice this, and again, I believe the Lord gave this to me. This, is the, this describes a New Testament book of Acts kind of church that we want to be. I can see an assembly, it's up on the screen, I can see an assembly of God's people worshiping with hands raised and the glory of God shining on their faces. I can see a joyous people of God who are enthusiastic about being in God's presence and thirsty for a drink of God's spirit. I dream of a church where at every gathering there are people rushing to the front to repent and surrender their lives to Jesus Christ. I can envision a building so full that there is standing room only and others lined up outside waiting for their opportunity to gather and and worship the living God. I can see a place where people are lovers of God and His Word and where there is a felt presence or a felt sense of reverence for God's Word as we open it up together. I can see a place where the children and the youth are filled with the Holy Spirit and ignited with a passion to tell others about Jesus. I can see an army of people who know who they are in Christ and who are filled with the Word of God and the Spirit of God going out from the assembly, ready to face a lost and dying world and love uh, with love and expectancy that the same God they experience within the walls of the church building is going to work through them as they reach out to their friends, families, and co-workers. And then I can see a people standing before the congregation, 
who were formerly bound by sins, addiction, sickness, and false religions, giving their testimonies of how they have been delivered from Satan's power and how Jesus Christ has set them free. They are living, walking testimonies of the power of a changed heart. I see a transformed city due to transformed hearts, where places of disrepute have to close, crime rates decline drastically, and where hope is restored to families. All of this would be considered to be unrealistic to many, if not most. But my reply is, if God be for us, who can be against us? Amen. If you've been blessed by this message today, please prayerfully consider giving to help support the ministry of Abounding Grace Christian Church. No gift is too small, and we'll agree with you in prayer that God will continue to bless you richly for your support. If you'd like to give online, go to agcc.church. The link is found below, and look for the green tab near the top that says Give Online. Or you can send your gift by mail to the address also below. Make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more videos coming in the future. And thank you so much, and God bless.